All right, so we're in Judges chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 6 down to verse 19. And the title, uh, we're going to be at least considering this theme of the anger of the Lord. And uh, it's kind of uh, very clear in this section that God is angry against sin, whether it's in his people or wherever it is. Uh, God absolutely hates sin. And we're going to see that very clearly in this section. So verse 6, it says, And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his, his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heres in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Geash. And also, all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtaroth, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hand of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said. And as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken to their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They cease not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. Uh, we've been looking at uh, the introduction, really, to the book of Judges. And part of this introduction is really explaining the reasons for the failure of the nation of Israel. Why, why did they fail after the wonderful successes that they'd experienced during Joshua's leadership, why did they fail this generation that we're reading about in the book of Judges? And we had mentioned last time, uh, but just by way of review, that part of the reason was their failure to go back to Gilgal, uh, the place of judging the flesh. And uh, they, they failed there miserably. And then a second reason that we're going to see today is what we're going to call the third generation syndrome. And we're going to see this, yeah. Israel's descent into idolatry. And one thing that we want to just mention is that the section uh, that we're going to read from verses 6 through 9 uh, is in exactly parallel to Joshua and chapter 24, verses 28 through 31. So it's, it's, it's really reviewing what's already been said in the book of Joshua. So he's going back and reviewing that uh, basically to explain uh, the failures uh, in the book of Judges. And so we, we get this, uh, these three generations listed. Uh, it tells us in verse 6, when Joshua let the people go, the children of Israel went every man to his inheritance to possess the land. So after the, the conquest of Canaan and the breaking of the back, if you like, of the Canaanite alliances, now it was left to the individual tribes to go into their inheritance 
and to push out the Canaanites that were left in their particular tribal territory. And so Joshua let the people go. The, the, the main campaign was done. And victory had been won. They had defeated, as it were, the mass forces of the Canaanites, uh, the various alliances, they defeated them. But now it's just a case of mopping up uh, the remainder of the Canaanites. And it tells us, verse 7, the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And it tells us, again, we've seen this before, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. Now, I want to just pause there. Although we've seen this before, it's just interesting that he is mentioned here as Joshua, the servant of the Lord. And that's a, a rare phrase in the word of God, really is, not used liberally at all. Uh, it's used of great men of God. It's used of people like Moses. It's used of David. It's very rare in the New Testament. I think it's only used of Timothy in the New Testament. So it's, it's not something that is just given out uh, freely. Uh, and yet what we're being reminded here was that, that Joshua was a great leader. He was in the kind of rank of the Moses and the David. Uh, he was a servant of the Lord. And what a wonderful thing to be termed a servant of the Lord. Uh, you know, sometimes we might look down at the idea of servant, but a servant of the Lord has a, a title of dignity about it. Uh, you're serving uh, the, the God of Israel. What a, what a wonderful thing to be a servant of the Lord. And so it says that uh, the servant of the Lord uh, had passed from the scene. Uh, he died being 110 years old. They buried him uh, in his inheritance, Timnath Heres, not particularly uh, a a uh, very fertile area, kind of in the mountains of Ephraim, uh, again, showing the humility of the man. Uh, he didn't get any special favors or any special uh, kind of allotment of land to his inheritance, uh, just a pretty ordinary, insignificant place. Uh, it tells us uh, its location, the north side of the hill, Geash. And then it says in verse 10, and also all that generation were gathered to their fathers. So that's Joshua and then the elders that outlived him, they were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them. So this is generation number three. And it tells us about this generation. And it says, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Now, they knew not the Lord, neither the works he'd done for Israel. It's not that they didn't know about the Lord. They would have heard it all their lives. Nor were they ignorant of the works the Lord had done in terms of hearing about it. They, they, no doubt they uh, had heard all these things many times. But it wasn't personal to them. They, they, as it were, they hadn't made the truth of this great God that had done such great things they hadn't made it their own. And you'll notice this phrase, they knew not the Lord. We should be familiar with it in our studies because we'd already seen it in when we studied 1 Samuel. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, for instance, in verse 12, we, we read this statement. It says, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial, worthless sons. And then it says this. They knew not the Lord. Now, again, we know they knew a lot about the Lord in the sense they were working in the tabernacle. They were the priests of Israel. They knew all about him, but they didn't know him personally. There wasn't that, uh, they weren't saved. They weren't, what we would say, regenerate or born again. Uh, they didn't have that personal, living, vital relationship with the Lord. Now, they still continued on working didn't they, these sons of Eli, in the tabernacle, and they still were uh, regular in attendance and doing all these things, but they didn't have that personal vital relationship with the Lord. And so it, it tells us, uh, we're stressing, it's not that they didn't know about Jehovah, obviously they did, or they were ignorant of his mighty acts, according to Israel's uh, testimony, the, the history of the nation. Uh, surely they were not ignorant of those things, but they 
they personally had not made it their own. They had no regard for it. They, they cared nothing for it. They didn't make it their own. And so this third generation did not acknowledge the Lord in their lives, uh, did not acknowledge his great works. And of course, it's always a challenge, isn't it? Uh, a perennial peril, really, of passing on the faith to subsequent generations. One generation can rejoice in a living faith, enjoy intimate communion with God, revel in the Lordship of Christ over their daily life, even delight to teach that faith to those closest to them. Yet the next generation comes along and has no interest and no care at all in those things. And of course, not that they'll necessarily abandon completely, and maybe they'll still continue to go along uh, to meetings. Maybe they'll still uh, have the form of godliness, uh, but deny the power thereof. Uh, but that what they do is they bring the, the cold, dead formality of somebody who does not have a living faith. And there's no fire in their faith. There's no warmth in it. There's no joy. There's no passion. Uh, because, well, if they have it at all, it's just an intellectual uh, acknowledgement, but not really life-changing. And so it, it's, it's kind of tragedy, but it's, it, it doesn't have to be that way. And I want to just remind us of an example of a third-generation believer in the New Testament. And I want us to go to 2 Timothy, because it's good to know that even though uh, this can often be the case. It doesn't have to be the case. And you just love this scripture. It says in verse 5, Paul of uh, Second Timothy chapter 1, Paul writing to uh, his co-worker Timothy, he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned, the, the, the real, nothing fake about it, the genuine faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So here we have an example of somebody who's a third generation, and he's the real deal. <laughs> and we know he is. He, his faith is not hypocritical. It's not, it's not sham. It's, it's the real thing. And what a wonderful thing. Three generations, godly grandmother, a godly mother, and now a godly grandson. What, what, what a wonderful thing, and, and how we need to pray uh, concerning passing on the faith. And especially uh, if we're second generation, uh, it's uh, even more challenging, isn't it? Because we know that the propensity is that the third generation can be like this generation that knew not the Lord, neither his works that he had done. They had no living, vital faith. And so F.C. Jennings, who's uh, certainly an author I've come to really love and appreciate in recent times, he mentions, uh, does not this add a kind of extra solemnity to our lot if we're living after a first generation has passed away? Does it not give stronger grounds for heart searching, for strong crying to God, for increased watchfulness? for clustering together in mutual love and exaltation. And so basically what he's saying is uh, we, we need to really be making diligent prayer concerning this, that our children and our children's children would have a passion for the Lord and love him with all their hearts, minds, soul, and strength. And it wouldn't be a third generation like we see here in the book of Judges. So the outlook was pretty bleak when you had a third generation like this. And at this point, he introduces us to what we want to call the sin cycle. And uh, it's seen uh, throughout the book of Judges. Uh, we've, we'll observe it. We've mentioned it already in our first introductory message. But there's this kind of cycle. You see it very clearly here. In verse 11 through 13, it begins with sin. It says, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And so it begins with sin, with rebellion, with turning their backs on the God of history. And so it begins with sin, and it always leads to servitude. And we need to just recognize that sin is enslaving. 
it it it's interesting in the 60s you had this whole movement where uh, free love you know free sex everything was free but it's not free because sin as the lord jesus rightly said whoever sins is the servant of sin and it's a cruel taskmaster it's a hard master and so we see as a result of it verse 14 and 15 the anger of the lord was hot against israel delivered them into the hands of spoilers spoiled them uh, it resulted in their distress and all the rest of it uh, at the end of verse 15 it says they were greatly distressed uh, sin leads to servitude uh, it, it's never uh, the way of the transgressor is hard. This is the message of scripture. And no matter how Hollywood portrays it differently, the bottom line is sin makes slaves. And so servitude and then supplication. Now it's kind of harder to see here in this little section, but it's still here. I really believe it is. At the end of verse 15, it says, uh, and they were greatly distressed. Down in verse 18, it says, for it repented the Lord right at the end because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And so we get the idea that they're in their deep distress, there are groanings that are coming forth from them. We'll think more about that word groanings in a little while. But I think the idea is this, that they're crying out to God in their servitude. Uh, they're, they're, they're groaning before the Lord. And it results in salvation. Verse 16, it says, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hands of those that spoiled them. And so we're going to see this pattern. We're just introducing it again, reminding ourselves of it. We're seeing it in this chapter. We're going to see it uh, throughout the book of Judges. And one person has said this, that if you want a, a quick synopsis of the book of Judges, he said, what you see in Judges is this. Firstly, the desperate wickedness of the human heart. We see man's ingratitude, his stubbornness, his rebellion, his folly. Uh, you can't look at this book without seeing clearly the desperate wickedness of the human heart. On the other hand, the other revelation that we get from this book is God's long-suffering, patience, love, and mercy. And I don't think there's any other book in the Bible that brings these two truths so clearly before us. Man's wickedness, God's long-suffering, patience, love, and mercy. And we're going to see that even in this session today. So it tells us the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Now, serving Balaam um, an idol, any kind of idol, of course, Balaam was an idol, is a master. It's, it's the master of the individual. And it's ironic that Baal actually means master or possessor or husband. That's the exact meaning of it. And so basically, they had, they had exchanged the Lord as their master for a new master. They were serving another master. And the Bible says, the Lord Jesus says it, right? You cannot serve two masters. And so they served another master, and that master was Baal. Of course, it's easy to know who our master is. Who, who is the one that possesses us? Uh, who's the one that, that our waking moments are, are thinking about? Uh, is it myself? Is it money? Is it, is it uh, career or, or is it the Lord? Who is my master? And uh, the book shows how easy it is to come under idolatrous influence. Now, I'm going to think a little bit about Baal. Baal was the rain god, and so he's connected to fertility of the land because you have to have rain to cause your crops to grow. And so he's the rain god. He's also the god of intellect because the people in that area, uh, they, were, they were dependent on rain uh, and weather was a mystery to them. I suppose it's a bit of a mystery to us too. And so Baal was their explanation for anything they could not understand themselves. Uh, he was the god of rain, the god of intellect. Later on, 
if you remember the contest on Mount Carmel. Remember what that was about between Elijah and the worshippers of Baal? It was about rain, wasn't it? Can the rain god send rain? They'd had three and a half years, if you remember, of no rain. And of course, the rain god proved to be totally incompetent in providing rain. And the God of Israel did indeed bring the rain. And so uh, this is who Baal was. This is who they went after. We'll think about the reason why uh, they went after Baal, but it does tell us again in verse 11 that the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, this phrase, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, it's used another six times in the book of Judges. So it gives us seven of these in total, and it always introduces a period of apostasy. It's the beginning of another sin cycle, if you like, and there are seven of them, and they always begin with this phrase, uh, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So I just want to run through them quickly so you can see this, this little pattern throughout the book. Chapter 3, for instance, verse 7, it says, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, forgot the Lord their God, and served Balaam and the groves. Chapter uh, 3, verse 12, again, we see the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 4 and verse 1, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead after the death of the judge. Chapter 6 and verse 1, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Chapter 10 and verse 6, Chapter 10, verse 6, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Zidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord and served not him. And then the final one, the seventh one, chapter 13, verse 1, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines. 40 years. So we get this almost like a mantra going through the book. The children of Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And why why was it that they were so quick to do this? Notice again, verse 12, it says, they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them, bowed themselves unto them, and provoke the Lord to anger. And what we see is that there's there's a certain amnesia involved. They forget what God had done for them. They forsook the Lord God their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt. And I really believe that part of what happens is they forget what God has done. There's there's this, if you like, this amnesia uh, and, and one of the things the Bible talks about over and over again is the importance to be reminded, to remember. Uh, that's why we have the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, isn't it? Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. We don't want to ever forget what the Lord has done for us in delivering us. And w- the minute we forget that, uh, we're in a dangerous position. And we're in a position where it's easy for us to drift. And so this spiritual amnesia produces apostasy, forgetting what the Lord had done. And so it begins this cycle of disobedience. But it's, it's always followed by divine discipline. Uh, again, we, we notice this. When they did this, when they provoke the Lord to anger. The reason I said this chapter is the anger of the Lord. I just want to read three references here in this chapter. Verse 12, at the end, they provoke the Lord to anger. Verse 14, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Verse 20, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And so we see God's anger because basically of their betrayal. They're turning their back on him. They're, uh, and again, he, Psalm 711, God is 
angry with the wicked every day. Uh, he, he's angry at sin because he knows how destructive sin is. He knows, you know, we, we only see a bit of the incredible wickedness that is being done in our world, and it disturbs us. I've been uh, watching uh, on YouTube a, a thing on the, on the Holocaust, and uh, it's just unbelievable the things that so-called civilized human beings did to their fellow men. And we only see a bit, but if you could, I often think of this, when you're looking over a city, imagine what's going on behind closed doors. And I'm glad that we don't know all that's going on because I don't know that we could handle it. I, I remember once hearing about something that had happened uh, on a news, uh, it was on the radio and it was just a news clipping. And it was only like a couple of minutes, but I was so disturbed. I couldn't even sleep that night thinking about what this person had done. And it was so disturbed. But what about God? He sees the devastation of sin and he's right to be angry. And especially when it's, own pe it's his own people who ought to know better. And so they provoked the Lord to anger and they forsook the Lord and served. Now it says Baal and Ashtaroth. Now, one of the things that we're going to see is that when they forsake the Lord, the Lord is quick to chasten them. And it's a mark of his love. Hebrews 12 tells us, doesn't it? Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And if there's no chastening, we have to question whether somebody really belongs to the Lord or not. One of the, one of the marks that we're truly a child of God is that our Father disciplines us for our own good, that we might be exercised thereby and that, that we might produce fruits of righteousness, basically. And so uh, we're going to see the Lord's going to discipline them. He's going to hand them over to their enemies. He's going to bring distress to them because he loves them, and he doesn't want them wallowing in their sin. And so it's, it's really uh, an inspired record, as we've said, of Israel's failure and God's faithfulness. And part of his faithfulness to every one of us, and none of us like it, but part of his faithfulness is his loving discipline of his children. How we thank God that he doesn't just leave us to our own devices. I remember several years ago, we were, uh, I guess my oldest boy, James, uh, we were shopping and there was a little, I think it might have been in a Walmart or something, and there was a kid who obviously couldn't get his own way and he was laying on the ground throwing up a tantrum. I mean, he was kicking dust in the air. It was just horrendous to watch. And my son, uh, I don't know what age he was, but he leaned over and he said, that lad needs a good spanking. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That lad needs a good spanking. Because he could see he wasn't happy. And he needed discipline. And, he, and it would make a difference in his life. And the Lord loves us enough not to leave us to ourselves. But he disciplines us. And it's good. We need that. Uh, we need it. And it's not easy, but we need it. So anyway, they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Now, Ashtaroth, we've, we've thought about Baal. She was uh, the, also known. And these, these gods, they kind of pop up in different cultures. So the one who's Ashtaroth uh, in Canaan is also the Babylonian god Ishtar. And in Rome, it's the goddess Easter. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, the, and, and of course, it's a goddess of fertility, whose signs were, interestingly enough, the signs that were connected with uh, at least the Roman god Easter, uh, goddess Easter, was the rabbit and the egg. You ever wonder why we have Easter eggs and Easter bunnies? <laughs> well, it's because it's not because of anything biblical at all. It's, it's paganism. And again, I, I've said all along, Catholicism is an unholy mixture of paganism, Judaism, and a thin veneer of Christianity over the top of it. But a lot of this is just pure paganism. So she, uh, again, the goddess of fertility. And so these, these two, Baal and Ashtaroth, make quite the pair. Uh, the god of the intellect and the goddess of the senses. And they're both involved in Fertility. Would it not be true that our society today worships these two gods? The God of intellect 
and the God of the senses, sensualism, and specifically uh, to do with sexual things. Very interesting that if you look at our culture, the whole pornography industry, for instance, it's really bowing down to Ashtaroth. It's worshiping the god, the goddess of senses, sensuality. And then you go to our universities, and it's worshiping Baal, the god of the intellect. And it's the tragedy is intellect is God-given, but our intellect is given to us to understand God's world, not in our arrogance to sit in judgment on God, his word, his world, his creation. And sadly, Baal and Ashtaroth worship is alive and well on our, in our culture. Every college campus is really, sadly today, a temple to Baal, to the God of the human intellect. Uh, every uh, sensual activity that's going on in our culture outside of God's design of marriage is basically the worship of Ashtaroth. And so this is what they did. They forsook the Lord, served Baal and Ashtaroth. Now, again, there's, there's a certain appeal to this because, um, again, part of what went on, and I don't want to go into all the graphic details, but there were temple prostitutes that were connected to the worship of Ashtaroth. And part of the idea was that in order to procure rains, uh, this, these, although Baal is very intellectual, the god of rain also was obviously had a short memory. And so people would go, and as, a, as an, an act of worship, they would have sexual relations with a temple prostitute to remind Baal and Ashtaroth to get busy so that they'd get some rain and some fertility uh, on their crops. And so that's, uh, and so you can see the appeal to a people who, uh, this appeals to the flesh. This is a kind of worship that sounds good if we're, if it's legitimate to do these things. And so that's basically why there was such an appeal and such a contrast to the God of scripture who is infinitely holy. <laughs> and so uh, the flesh loves this kind of thing. And so they they followed basically their flesh. And so verse 14 says, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. There was a time when their enemies couldn't stand before them. The fear of God was, was upon them. But now there's a reversal and they cannot stand before their enemies. They're, they're in a, the slavery phrase, uh, phase of their existence. It says, whithersoever, verse 15, they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. I want to think about this. The strong hand of the Lord was against them for evil. Now look back to the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus in chapter 13, and you'll see that when God delivered them from Egypt, it says in verse 3 of Exodus 13, and Moses said unto the people, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place, there shall no leavened bread be eaten. So you've got this idea that the hand of the Lord, the strong hand of the Lord was for them in delivering them from Egyptian bondage. And now the very strong hand of the Lord was against them because they had abandoned him and gone over to the worship of Baal and Ashtaroth. And as a result of that, they were in deep distress, just as the Lord had warned them. And again, remember Deuteronomy, uh, the blessings and the cursings and uh, this uh, ritual on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, uh, how they were to be reminded that there were consequences to their choices. And he says, 
in verse uh, Deuteronomy 28, verse 25, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And we need to recognize the awesome consequence of choice. Choices have consequences. And the Lord is showing them this. You choose to turn your back on me. You choose to go after these the gods of the intellect and the flesh, and there will be consequences. And the Lord's hand was heavy against them, and they were in deep, deep distress. And yet, having said all that, here's the wonder of it all. In verse 16, it says, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And so the same God that's hand is heavy against them, when they cry out to him in supplication, he is very quick to bring deliverance to them and raise up judges that will deliver them out of the hands of their enemies. And we've already mentioned these judges, with the exception particularly of Deborah, they're not really judges that we think of with a gown and a wig and, you know, kind of pronouncing uh, judgment on issues. They were really political leaders uh, that led the people militarily against their enemies. And so the Lord raised up these judges uh, in his mercy towards them and brought deliverance. And yet it says in verse 17, and yet they would not hearken to their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, which they, but they did not so. And it, again, the choice of the word of going a whoring is both spiritual and in the case of Ashtaroth, physical. They literally went after temple prostitutes in a physical sense, but they were they were whoring, uh, they were playing the harlot against God, who should have been their husband, but they went after Baal. Remember, we said whose name means master or husband, uh, and so they basically, both literally and spiritually, went a whoring from the Lord, even though He had raised up judges to deliver them. They were quickly back into their old ways again. And so it says, verse 17, yet they would not hearken to their judges, and they went a-whoring. And verse 18, and when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And so uh, we get this interesting phrase, it repented the Lord because of their groanings. I want to think about this phrase groanings for a moment. It's a it's a, an interesting uh, noun that's that's used in the Old Testament on three other occasions. Uh, one of them is in the book of Ezekiel, and not particularly relevant in the sense of it speaking of Pharaoh groaning under the uh, the, the work of the Babylonians punishing him. But the other two references are very relevant. And I want us to look, please, back to the book of Exodus and chapter 2 and verse 24. Exodus 2 and verse 24. It says, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Look at chapter 6, please. Exodus chapter 6. Again, same kind of context. Exodus 6 and verse 5, where we get this word groaning again. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage. I'll redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgment, so on and so forth. So, again, we get this idea that, uh, that God, who is angry at their sin, and yet when they grow, 
he feels this compassion for them and he is quick and swift to bring deliverance to them. And why this is so significant is that the references in Exodus were approximately 1400 BC. The reference in Judges, approximately 1100 BC. So literally hundreds of years have passed, but God has not changed that when his people grow because of their own sin and their own folly and their own judgment that is upon them, God can't resist a broken and a contrite spirit. <laughs> and he always has to step in and deliver them. And isn't it good to know that he doesn't change? He, he still is angry with the wicked, but when his people, despite their waywardness and folly, when they cry out to him, groaning, he responds to their cry and he hears it and he raises up deliverers for them. Such is his mercy, such is his never ending compassion for his people. And so it tells us in verse 19 it came to pass that the judge, when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Now, a couple of interesting points that we need to observe here in verse 19 is, first of all, that there's an increasing intensity to the slavery of sin. It says they corrupt themselves more than their fathers. And so, it, it, it is an interesting thing about sin it, it is that uh, it, 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 it doesn't improve. It, it gets, you, people get worse. They, they go darker and deeper as they go into these sin cycles. You see it in the nation of Israel, but you see it in cultures. Uh, it's kind of called the law of diminishing returns. And so a man that takes drugs, initially the first experience he gets an incredible high but he has to keep on taking more and more and more to get the same level of satisfaction so it takes him deeper and deeper and deeper down this road into insanity in a sense uh, sexual sin people may look at something uh, mildly pornographic but and it, it it has its effect upon them sensual their sensuality but but the next time they have to go further and it keeps on going, keeps on going until it gets to more and more depraved. Uh, the drunkard didn't take much because your body's not used to it, just a little bit of alcohol, and that's all it takes. But the more your body gets used to it, the more you have to take to get the same effect. And so we just see that, that sin, the part of the reason it's enslaving is that it really doesn't satisfy. <laughs> it doesn't. And so they have to do more and more bizarre to get the same level of excitement out of it. And so it, it tells us they corrupt themselves more and more. We see this, and we'll see it through the book of Judges, that each time it seems like they get further and further away. And we read in one of those occasions when the people of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they went after, and it went listed all the different gods they went after. It wasn't just Baal and Ashtaroth, but it was, they were going after everything. Uh, and so the increasing slavery of sin. And Israel did not listen to her judges. Uh, they, uh, they, they kind of submitted all the days of the judge, uh, but, but afterwards they, they corrupted themselves. After the judge was dead, they corrupted themselves more, than, more and more. The second thing to notice too, which I think is interesting, it says at the end of verse 19, that they cease not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. Two thoughts here. One of, one of the first things we need to recognize is their own doings. They're not, you can't blame their sin on their environment. You can't blame their sin on their medical condition. It's their own doings, right? When we sin, we decide to do it. It's our own conscious deliberate choice. 
And so it, 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 was, it was their decision. And also, not only is it their own doing, um, nor from their stubborn way. That word stubborn, uh, it, it's the idea of hard uh, or severe. Uh, it, it's, it's the idea that they had become hard in their hearts. Their hearts had become hardened. They become very, very stubborn. It's good to realize that a new environment doesn't affect our physical ability to sin. Uh, a change of location, even coming into the promised land, didn't mean a change for the heart of the Israeli people. And so you could put a man in a monastery and it doesn't change because that man is in the monastery and his evil heart is there. And so it doesn't make any difference what the location is. And they developed this hard, unyielding heart. And so it tells in verse 20, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened to my voice, I will also, I will also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left them, left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them unto the hand of Joshua. So what we find here is the Israelites really wanted the Canaanite nations around them. Remember, they didn't drive them out. They allowed them to stay there. They wanted this. That was their choice. They thought, we'll put them under tribute. We'll make them work for us. They didn't obey the Lord. They said, so we, we want these people here. And so God says, okay, if that's what you want, I take you seriously. That's what you will have. And so he says, I will not henceforth drive out any of them before the nations. And so the worst thing God can do for us sometimes is give us the desire of our hearts. Psalm 106 verse 15 is a very sobering verse. It says, he gave them the desire of their hearts, but sent leanness to their souls. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Because the Lord might just take you seriously and say, okay, if that's what you want, I'll give it to you. So these nations were left, and they were left to prove them. And it was a, really a test of loyalty. A test of our love and loyalty when we're living in a pagan culture. Every single day, we're tested with our love and loyalty. Are we going to follow the Lord, or are we going to give in? to the dictates of our surrounding wicked culture. See, we have an opportunity today. We're being proved, tested. How is our love and loyalty to the Lord? Has he done a lot for us? Oh, he sure has. He's redeemed us at great price. And he loves us and he disciplines us and he chastens us. And when we groan, he brings deliverance for us. But on a daily basis, our love and loyalty is being tested. May God help us to be faithful to his tests and show our love and loyalty to him. May the Lord challenge us and encourage us with this very sobering session uh, from the book of Judges. Amen.